good evening. Thank you for being here. For those who don't know me, let me introduce myself. My name is Morag, and as a long-standing member of the Radical Anthropology Group, I'd like to thank Chris and Camilla for inviting me to speak this evening. Indeed, it's really thanks to Chris and Camilla that I'm involved in anthropology at all. I'm about to graduate from my um, MA in, um, at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, in Cultural Astrology and Astronomy. Um, it's a course that is conducted entirely online, which has given me the opportunity to investigate areas such as ritual and symbolism, albeit seen through a cosmological lens. As my background is costume and theatre, I'm in charge of the fabric stockroom at the Royal Opera House. Um, my dissertation focuses on textiles, more specifically upon the cosmology within the creation of textiles. Let's see if I'm going the right way. Oh, no. Ooh, what happens? Oh, OK. That's, oh, no, it's gone too far, sorry. Ah, OK, I think I'm all right. It's on a bit of a wobbly, wobbly thing there. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so, Nicholas Campion, the course director, says that cosmology can be understood as a meaning system, one that has huge significance for almost every aspect of human behaviour. The Greek word, Greek word cosmos, he translates as beautiful order, and you can see how that could immediately be applicable to the crafts of spinning and weaving. I feel that such an open definition of cosmology has allowed my study a certain freedom and breadth, um, allowing it to flow through multiple disciplines. My talk this evening springs from the research conducted last autumn for my dissertation, which investigated as to whether ritual and symbolic elements are present in the practice of contemporary weavers and spinners. The inspiration sparked from a visit to the American Museum in Bath yeah. um, and their collection of Navajo woven textiles. It came from an encounter with, the two, with two First Nation poems expressing the cosmology inside Navajo weaving. The aesthetics surrounding them seem deeply imbued with cosmology, as can be illustrated by the first of the two poems, The Song of the Sky Loom. The weaving for us a garment of brightness. May the warp be the white light of morning. May the weft be the red light of evening. May the fringes be the falling rain. May the borders be the standing rainbow. Thus weave for us a garment of brightness, that we may walk fittingly where the birds sing, that we may walk fittingly where the grass is green. O oh, our mother the earth, O oh, our father the sky. Further investigation seems to indicate that cosmology that was deep within weaving in the Native American worldview was replicated in many diverse cultures, manifesting itself in every continent. As a practitioner myself, this sense of there being something more than the mere production of fabric drew me towards exploring the evidence for cosmology in traditions and mythologies inspired by spinning and weaving. If, I asked, cosmology plays such a significant part in weaving and spinning in cultures of so many societies across the ages, was it possible to detect a symbolic undercurrent in the practices of contemporary spinners and weavers? Did this contribute to the mystery, the sacred glow, as Alan Miller calls it, that surrounds the crafts of spinning and weaving? This talk will share the journey of exploration, looking at the mythologies and cultural practices where spinning and weaving are viewed symbolically and ritualistically, compiling what is effectively a body of evidence for cosmology within spinning and weaving. I have concentrated mostly on the processes and procedures involved in spinning and weaving. Oops. Not really there, am I? Okay. Um, in spinning and weaving, rather than the actual product, the spun wool or the woven textile, for basically two reasons. My main interest here is whether there is something intrinsically symbolic in the practices themselves, whether they have a natural cosmology within them. The other point is that by focusing on the actions and the process rather than the product, I am better able to assess the propensity for, of weaving and spinning for symbolism rather than examining the finished article, which is more likely to be culturally defined, in other words, specific 
to each culture. Once gathered, this evidence was given, sorry, was offered to contemporary craftspeople in order to discover whether a ritual and symbolic factors I had encountered within spinning and weaving could be discerned in their practices. To discover what the practitioners themselves think, I prepared and posted an online questionnaire and subsequently conducted interviews to gain a greater empathy with their thoughts and opinions. I will give a short account of the research findings later in the talk. But I would just like to elaborate a little on what attracts me to this study. As part of my passion about exploring what it is to be human, I am drawn to the idea of what we could call anthropology of the everyday, what is here and now and in front of us. So rather than conduct a purely cross-cultural study surrounding spinning and weaving, I was interested to see how the cosmology inherent in these ancient crafts fitted in with everyday practices of contemporary artisans, of whether echoes of a pre-industrial time might survive into our digital age. The final component of this research project was the experiential element, the practicing of the crafts themselves, of actually spinning and weaving. Oops. It seemed to me essential to make a part of this research practical, operating a kind of hands-on material balance to the entire investigation. This practical contribution sought to offer applied experiential insight into both the evidence and the research findings, forming, performing a form of research that Tim Ingold calls knowing from the inside. In looking into the symbolic and ritualistic properties of spinning and weaving, we should not ignore the fact that spinning and weaving are, on an empirical level, primarily a functional means of cloth production. This duality between the practical and the symbolic is central to this study. Um, sorry, I've got a double piece of paper here. Sorry. To discover what the practitioners themselves... Th oh, I've done that bit. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I propose to begin this evening's journey by looking at the evidence for cosmology and sacred symbolism within spinning and weaving found in the mythologies and <coughs> mythologies of diverse cultures. Rather than examine this evidence case by case, culture by culture, I will attempt to paint something of an overview, which will show the significant role that the crafts play within mythology cross-culturally. That these associations have occurred in so many different cultures across the world is testimony to the position that the production of textiles might have held in the development of culture. At its most unambiguous, the myths connecting spinning and weaving to cosmology involve nothing less than the creation of the world. The Navajo legend of the Spider Woman sits within the tradition of the Navajo of the Native American cosmogonic myths. The Spider Woman instructed the Navajo women how to weave on a loom, which Spider Men told them how to make. The cross poles were made of sky and earth cords, the warp sticks of sun rays, and the heddles of rock crystal and sheet lightning. The baton was a sun halo, white shell made the cone. There were four spindles, one a stick of zigzag lightning with a whorl of cannel coat, one a stick of flash lightning with a whorl of turquoise, a third had a stick of sheet lightning, a whorl of abalone, a rain streamer formed the stick of the fourth, and its whorl was a white shell. Here, the cosmology is unequivocal. Spinning and weaving implements are transmogrified as cosmic entities. Prominence is given to lightning, the one meteorological event that genuinely epitomizes connection between earth and heaven. The myth speaks of weaving, not in terms of the woven article, the product, but about the processes, about the simple technology that manufacture entails and about the human agency required to make it happen in cosmological terms. The notion of a woven cosmos permeates many Mesoamerican myths. 
in the Aztec worldview. The sky is woven with cords of fabric connecting the heavens to the earth, similar imagery to that of the Navajo legend of the Spider Woman. Celia F. Klein depicts a Mesoamerican mythology that is analogous to two sides of woven cloth, where the smooth woven fabric on one side creates the sky and the tangled underside fashions the earth. A weaving myth can be regarded as cosmological owing to its astronomical prominence. For example, in the ancient Chinese myth, the cow herd and the weaving maiden, Princess Shen Yu is engaged in weaving the stars, the clouds, or gay garments for the gods, depending on the version. When she falls in love with a mortal, she neglects her tasks, and the stars grow dim. The lovers are exiled into the sky, becoming two stars, Vega and Altair, divided by the Silver River, which is the Milky Way, and reunited only once a year. Here, finding human love leads to a disengagement with the act of weaving, initiating her removal from status and position, a transition of existence, perhaps even a form of death. The legend is still celebrated annually on the seventh day of the seventh month of the Chinese lunar calendar at the Quixi Festival, when the two stars are at their closest. Thus, the myth is entirely embedded in astronomy. The lovers' meeting occurs precisely at the moment when the two stars are in their closest proximity. In fact, it can be regarded almost as an anthropomorphic representation of a celestial event, an incarnation of an astrological moment. The notion that spinning and weaving not only have celestial origins, but also have divine provenance, can be attested by the existence of weaving and spinning goddesses in many cultures. Connecting the crafts with divinity, to be more specific, with female divinity. In the Shinto religion, the Chinese goddess Amaratsu, known in the Kojigi as Heaven Shining, is still revered today. For Alan Miller, the cosmic, indeed mythic power of the goddess is at its most explicit in the process of weaving. In the Ise Grand Shine in Japan, ritually rebuilt every 20 years, Amaratsu is presented with a miniature sacred loom, symbolizing her, her vital role in the maintenance of the cosmos. Divinity bestows upon weaving a sacred significance, not only for those who weave the ceremonial garments, but arguably also for the status of ordinary spinners and weavers. There are resonances here of the activity of doing God's work, the Neoplatonic notion of theurgy, something that perhaps filters down into contemporary society, where, for example, London livery guilds still retain the title worshipful, as in the worshipful company of weavers. For the dissertation, I compiled a chart in order to demonstrate the multiplicity of weaving goddesses. Not designed to be comprehensive, but from a sheer numerical standpoint, it serves to illustrate the extent to which such female deities appear within mythology cross-culturally. From it, we can see that several themes emerge. Some goddesses are engaged, like Shay Nu, in the maintenance of the cosmos. The North, Norse goddess Frigga spins the clouds and knows the fate of all men. The Hindu goddess Usha weaves the colours of the dawn, and the Egyptian goddess Neith, according to mythology, strung up her loom and wove the world. For some goddesses, weaving and spinning are just one of many attributes, one of many emblems of power. The most glamorous of them must be Athena, who was not only goddess of the art of weaving, but also wisdom, courage, inspiration, civilization law and justice, strategic war, mathematics, strength, strategy, and the arts and crafts. We can detect an important connection with weaving and blood, something we will return to quite often. This is particularly the case in the Mesoamerican tradition, whereby, whoops, whereby at the Otsipensil Festival in Aztec, Mexico, 
there occurred a ritual reenactment entailing the beheading of a weaver who was replaced by a male that represented the weaving goddess. The decapitation and gender changed seen by scholars as depending on the phases of the moon. Indeed, several Aztec goddesses have associations with weaving and blood, including Sotzequetzal, the wayward wife of the sun god, and the slightly sinister figure of Siwakoatl, duly represented by a weaving baton and a shield. She is also patroness of weaving and midwifery, reflecting the Aztec notion of Grandmother Moon engaged in weaving children, which we will come across, we will come across this association with blood later as well. Another theme is weaving and spinning being the attributes of a consort or creator god. One striking example is the hypothesis that the West Semitic goddess Asherah was actually the wife of Yahweh and mistress of Baal, who she tried to stab with a spindle for not sleeping with her. Indeed, the association of spinning with holy women carries on into the Christian tradition. Medieval iconography shows Eve and the Virgin Mary using a distaff and a drop spindle. In tracing the significance of spinning and weaving within mythology, we come to their association with destiny. We have already met Frigga, who spins the clouds and knows the fate of all men. <clears throat> In Plato's Myth of Ur, the three Moiras control the destiny of the souls of the underworld seeking rebirth. They personify the stages of womanhood and the and the process is involved in spinning. Clotho, the maiden, spins the thread of life. Lachesis, the maiden, measures the thread of life. And the elderly, Atopos, cuts it. This is closely matched with the Norns in the Norse tradition, who are three spirits, Erd, the Dander, and Skuld, denoting past, present, and future, who spin the thread of life. Indeed, Elder Haida suggests that another word for the word sorry, suggests that another reading of the word Norn is witch. At this point, I think it is important to look at how spinning and weaving function as metaphor. The significance of metaphor in human cognition is testified by scholars such as George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, who state that metaphorical concepts are, necess are necessary for understanding most of what goes on in our world. Claude Lévi-Strauss sees metaphor as a means of reintegrating the natural thought processes based on an intuitive sense of the logical relations between one realm and other realms. Metaphor reintegrates the first realm with the totality of the others. The crucial thing here is that metaphor, as Brenda Beck notes, is able to express difficult abstract notions within some immediately graspable image, in this case, the actions of spinning and weaving. Indeed, the use of phrases such as spinning a yarn or let's get weaving in everyday speech by people who have never encountered a spinning wheel or a loom would suggest that the metaphor is understood within a cultural context and has been handed down to us from generations where the experience of spinning and weaving were ubiquitous. Perhaps one of the reasons why metaphor for weaving and spinning is so resilient can be found in the activities themselves. It has been suggested that the logic of production is directly analogous to the, lo to the logic of procreation and reproduction. For Karen Beck Pettersen, it is the technical process and the human agency that drives it that allows spinning and weaving to form a convincing analogy for fate. In spinning, the process entails a journey from an amorphous mass of fleece into an evenly plied skein of yarn, epitomizing, perhaps, the thread of life, creating a kind of timeline. The yarn's length is determined by the size of the bobbin on which it is spun, thereby necessitating a cut, symbolically epitomizing the end of life or the end of time. Spun yarn is also 
an almost visceral association with the umbilical cord, the original thread of life, further giving rise to the metaphorical association with blood and midwifery. In the case of weaving, the fate metaphor is also deeply connected to the actual technical process. The warp is made up of highly tensioned thread, ordered and predetermined by the artisan creator, in this case, me. Once selected, once selected, the warp cannot be changed. The weft, however, the horizontal cross strokes, have the freedom to establish a woven pattern of choice. In this way, the balance between necessity and possibility works as a clear analogy of the balance between fate and free will. The metaphor of weaving as body tissue springs from this notion, whereby through weaving, disordered yarn is given structure, given form, a form of incarn incarnation. Indeed, in the Psalms, we have the idea that God wove me in my, in my mother's womb. Mary Kilborn Matossian claims that tissue originally meant something woven, reinforcing the analogical extension of weaving and spinning to human blood, whether from birth, death, or even menstruation, which we find in myths and folklore. Fate and destiny are not the exclusive beneficiaries of the spinning and weaving metaphor, however. I'm not sure if I should have changed the slide there. Um, whatever the nature of the metaphorical illusion, it still derives directly from the technological processes. Okay. Yep, we're okay. The action metaphor, <coughs> that of the actual process of weaving, can be seen as speaking. Correspondingly, the completed textile metaphor may be understood as the written word. And so, by extension, we have the notion of weaving words together to create poetry, illustrated by the 11th century Persian poet Faruqi of Sistan. The robe I bore was spun within my heart and woven in my soul, a silken robe, composed of words that eloquence designed, I laboured hard to draw its warp and weft from deep within myself. You'll find it in the rarest figures and finest metaphors. The spinning metaphor, when applied to words, is subtly different. It is more about line, which according to Ingold, is no more and no less than life itself. The metaphor is derived literally from the creation of thread, the thread of cognitive thought perhaps, a line of language that can be manipulated, for example, by modern day political spin doctors. The narrative in folklore and fairy tale featuring spinning and weaving often serves as a catalyst for strange happenings outside the laws of time. Take the Irish folk tale, The Spinning Woman, collected by Kevin Danahar from the oral tradition which links two of our themes, magic and blood. The spinner was called upon to act as a midwife to an unknown young woman in a strange, unrecognised location. Which she when she returned home, she found her wool had been magically spun at night. The magic, however, was not unconditional. When she put her neighbour's wool out to be spun, it was not touched. Again, this connection with spinning and with midwifery is significant, echoing the aforementioned Aztec goddesses. It operates as an extension of the thread of life image and reinforces the association with blood. The fate, the fate connection is to be found in folklore too. Shakespeare applies it through the actions and language of the weird sisters in Macbeth, themselves harbingers of fate. It has been argued that the word weird is etymologically derived from the Anglo-Saxon weird meaning fate, which in turn comes from the Indo-European root meaning to turn as a spindle turns. A list of other supernatural figures with spinning and weaving connections should include figures such as Holder and Brechter in the German tradition who appear in houses where a member of the family is about to die. 
also the figure of Haribot, a spinning spirit fairy cr crone that springs from the borders of lowland Scotland, who sports a deformed lip as a result of tirelessly spinning, mirroring the German tale of the three spinners or the Norwegian tradition, the three aunts, where the spinners are afflicted by a splayed foot and a flat thumb as well. As is to be expected, the folklore intertwines with Christianity. For example, St. Pareskova Paranitsa, who has weaving connections, has been linked to the terrifying Russian spinning crone Baba Yaga. Perhaps the most familiar example of spinning and weaving in fairy tales is the sharp tip of the spindle in the Brothers Grimm tale, The Briar Rose, more familiar to us as the Sleeping Beauty. Chris has written and lectured extensively on how this provides the access point, literally, so blood can be spilt, acting as the catalyst to a magical domain that facilitates the rites of passage. So here we have the right mixture of blood and the magic at the right time and the right place. Indeed, it's wonderfully rich territory, more than worthy of an evening in itself. But before I move on, I just need to touch on the presence of weaving and spinning myths and imagery within literature. Such imagery is found frequently in Homer and the Greek lyric, am I on the right one? Greek lyric poets, perhaps showing the significance of weaving and spinning within ancient Greek society, but also eloquent of the strong association with cosmic symbolism, such as the woven robes spangled with stars and planets, echoing the embroidered constellations to be found in Plato's Timaeus. Of the myths where spinning and weaving are, actu are actually the context of the narration, the power of this symbolic nature becomes apparent. I will briefly address three of them, two from the classics and also The Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson. In the Odyssey, Penelope, wife of Ulysses, will only accept suitors when her weaving is completed. By unpicking her weaving at by night, she is able to remain faithful to her husband. In the case of the weaving contest between Athena and Arachne in Ovid's Metamorphosis, Arachne's scant reward for challenging the goddess is to be turned into a spider. And in the case of the Lady of Shalott, it is when the physical weaving activity stops, caused by the distraction of a handsome knight, she can sense in her mirror that decline and death ensue. In these three tales, the weaving image is symbolic of time, power, and life, for life force itself. Quite a threesome. And it's spinning and weaving as life force, which I would like to turn to now. Many of the points of inquiry in the research questionnaire focuses on the transformative potential of weaving and spinning and their propensity for ritual and even mysticism. So as a balance to the evidence gathered from the mythology, I proceeded to look into the ethnographic studies of cultures that regard the activities as, as possessing some sort of additional essence, exploring the capacity for spinning and weaving to create life force, to transform energy and space, to create order out of disorder, to alter consciousness of the practitioners and to give them a sense of well-being. These then are the fruits of agency, the metaphysical or indeed supraphysical offshoot of the physical activity. Spinning doesn't just give you a splayed foot, a hanging lip or a flat thumb, it can also be experienced as a symbolic activity leading to a spiritual pathway for some practitioners. In many cultures, spinning and weaving are seen as the doorway to the ancestors' world. In fact, it is, possible, it is possible to say that ancestors provide a theme that runs through the whole field, connecting life force, essence, materiality, embodiment, magic, physicality and rhythm, almost like the vertical warp threads 
that intertwine with those of the weft. In some indigenous societies, ancestors are active entities, according to Graham Harvey, understood to be present in their people. For him, the least interesting thing about them is that they are dead. It is possible to consider that ancestral traditions continues to inform modern day practitioners of textile crafts. Although our ancestors may be dead, their knowledge is not. The fact that artisan skills are traditionally passed on from one generation to another amount to a shared ancestral connection, especially with their maternal ancestry. On a personal note, weaving is on both sides of my family, and like many others, I was taught to knit by my mother and grandmother. Roy Dilley, in his paper on Senghalese hand weavers, remarks that weaving is regarded as essentially a magical act, and that the weavers themselves consider themselves as experts in magic. For the magic to occur, there needs to be a human agent and some kind of process or technology to activate the magic. So is that intrinsic in the activity itself? For Alan Miller, the magic of weaving derives from the contrast between the simplicity of the principles of the loom mechanism in relation to the complexity of the finished product. And that is what he feels is at the heart of the sacred glow of the loom. The mystery, the magic if you like, arising from the fusion of technology and human agency is contingent on the skill of the practitioner, illustrating a connection between magic and practical activity, and indeed technical proficiency, as noted by Stanley Tambaya. For the Maori, the, for the, Maori, the weaver and, and the action of weaving is believed to incarnate life force, Maori, authority, mana, and the sacred, tapu. Indeed, Maori weavers offer prayers to safeguard ancestral knowledge and inspiration. Macaulay and Ruiri emphasize the duality involved, how the functionality of the weaving process is offset by ritual procedure, whereby the practice may be governed by ritual prohibitions, but is enriched by what they call the potency of the sacred. It is tempting to apply Emile Durkheim's theory of the sacred of sacred and profane to this. I began work on the dissertation with it as a central theory, but I had problems with the word profane, profane, overloaded as it is with negative implications. And indeed, I found that I also had problems with the concept of sacrality. Theories such as Jack Goody had questioned the universality of the sacred <coughs> profane dichotomy and that sacrality was, more often than not, attributed according to the outsider's extraneous value systems. So rather than be governed by an on-off switch, sacrality for contemporary scholars such <coughs> as Peter Mattieri is something of a relative concept. So within the all-embracing nature of the Maori worldview, weaving can be simultaneously a sacred and a utilitarian activity. Graham Harvey speaks of the inseparability of seeming opposites, which resonates strongly with John Schneider's and Jesper Svenbra's concept of the warp and weft in weaving being seen symbolically as unions of opposites. Space, can be, space has the capacity to be modified, qualified, and reconfigured by the presence of activities such as spinning and weaving. For example, setting up the locale of weaving potentially transforms the loom into a sacred space. Dilly shows how Sengaleve weavers are required to select the correct placing of their narrow strip looms facing towards the east according to alignments prescribed by ritual precedents, indeed believing that their ancestors reclaimed the loom at night. With the activity of weaving regarded as sacred, the Tokalor weavers hold to the belief that weaving is like praying. Seeds of millet are placed under two of the loom's posts as a form of ritual protection, as well as an aid to germination, 
in other words, to aid the growing of the cloth. In this way, the space where weaving is enacted becomes transformed into a sacred space. But we have to remember the human element in all of this. The configuration of weaver and loom is governed by the individual relationship between the dimensions of the weaver's body and those of the loom. This can be seen most clearly in the mechanics of a backstrap loom, where the human physicality provides the tension for the warp threads. The human body, therefore, has become part of the process, both in terms of its structure and its actions. If we think of Maurice Merleau-Ponty's system of experience, whereby the physical body is inescapably linked with phenomena, phenomena, here it is the weaver's interactive body that defines the space, enveloping the external parameters of the loom. In the case of a pedal-operated loom, the weaver is placed at the operative centre, being in the middle of the frame as its protagonist, like a church organist. The significance of the body in the process of pre-industrial textile production can be exemplified by a Guatemalan warping board, where the, the yarns are wound to create the warp. The board is fashioned in the shape of a human body, and the threads would appear like sinews. Mercia Eliada's notion of the consecration of space as a recurrent cosmogony fits well into the cyclical nature of weaving and spinning, where the repeated gestures intrinsic to the processes of the manipulation of yarn can be seen symbolically as recurrent reenactments of the first creation, echoing the spider woman's cosmic shuttles that connect earth to heaven. The constant rhythmic refeeding involved in spinning and weaving can also be inter interpreted as a form of ritual repetition, with the spinning and weaving implements themselves serve as a physical metaphor for renewal. Performative ritual of all kinds often incorporates sequential rhythms, rhythms that are generated by regular rhythmic repetition, whether that involves, say, drumming, chanting or dance. In this instance, we're talking about embodied repetition where the rhythmic patterns enter the practitioner's body and may be exhaled in song or rhyme. Ranging from doggerel to formal incantations, these ritual utterings also serve as a mnemonic function in committing complex designs and numerical patterns to memory. The rhythm of the physical labour becomes transmuted into song, as in the case of Hebridean walking songs, which accompanied the process of finishing the cloth. The same phenomena was noted by Tilly amongst the Chocolor weavers, and indeed Anthony Tuck thinks of the rhythmic metrical patterns inherent in song that were originally mnemonic in function may have played a role in the development of poetry itself. Perhaps poetry has its origins in spinning and weaving. There are points where the synthesis of the rhythms of spinning and weaving with ritual can impact upon a practitioner's consciousness and induce a sense of the mesmeric. The constant repetition combined with the audible sense of cyclical rhythm causes a shift away from what Roy Rappaport calls social time towards the organic and the cosmic. This gives rise to a perceived paradox, seen at its most pertinent with spinning, whereby as some spinners work rhythmically faster, they begin to lose themselves in their work, progressively entering a realm of extraordinary time. This fusion of endless repetition and absolute changelessness for Rappaport represents two sides of eternity. For the spinners, this quiet centre of the spinning spindle or wheel, which I like to think of as the still point, the turning world, to use a line from T.S. Eliot, forges a link between the temporal and non-temporal, a form of axis mundi, between earth and heaven. Along with this concept of suspended time, there is also the notion of propitious time. Matthew Kapstein notes that Buddhist ritual ceremonial weavers are aware of the correct time to weave is the appropriate astrological time, 
right time, right place. The poetic metaphors contained in the myth of the spider worm for, tr for traditional practitioners such as Tiana Big Horse are actually experienced on a personal level. For her, weaving implements are infused with elemental energies which help maintain a connection with the ancestors. So the tools are acknowledged to contain and impart knowledge of their usage beyond their metaphorical significance. Their ownership is respected. It is not permissible, for instance, to scratch one's back with a weaving baton. Their loss or destruction may bring about an inability to spin and weave proficiently in that the broken, ten broken connection with the tools causes a lost connection with the knowledge of the craft. The idea that functioning tools contain cosmic symbolism can further be can be further illustrated by sun disk imagery on spindle warrors, such as those found in Mexico, which Elizabeth Bomfield interprets as solar energy, the cyclical or rotatory movement epitomizing a spatial and temporal order of the universe. The cosmology is in more than just the iconography. When spun, the action of spinning forces the Worrell's cosmic images to spin above the central axis, bringing the shapes to life. Loom weights can, be exhibited, can exhibit a symbolic significance beyond their function. Susan Ackerman cites an example of an engraved image of Athena as a spinning owl, serving perhaps as a material talismanic object linking the practitioner to divinity. In my case, the absence, absence of a sacred loom weight, a hot water bottle stopper, had to suffice. The degree in which inanimate objects carry symbolic meaning beyond their empirical function, the two sides to materiality, as Tim Ingold puts it, is pertinent to this research. Defined over thousands of years, their functional, simple devices for creating textiles have developed long and rich histories, meaning, <coughs> given meaning from the human life that has surrounded them. If spinning and weaving implements are capable of holding a symbolic history, then can it be said that woven articles and spun yarn retain the essence of their making? Ingold suggests that they do. The manner in which unraveled thread always preserves the direction of, it tw of its twist demonstrates that the energies used in making process leave an indelible imprint of the actual impulse of creation upon the fabric. Whether artifacts have an essence beyond this, something akin to a form of enduring spirit and soul quality, leads us tentatively towards notions of animism. Emilio Maldini makes a good point suggesting that any form of technology involving tools that perform actions invite us to give a soul and a destiny to inanimate objects. With handmade textiles, there is an added fact factor of direct human can contact. Indeed, whether contemporary spinners and weavers can identify with a uniqueness in hand-woven and hand-spun artifacts amounting to a fingerprint of their creation turned out to be one of the key lines of um, inquiry in my research. I'm sorry, just a light or right? Yeah. I was thinking if you can move the, that blind up. If you, no, I think I'm okay. You can, I couldn't read in that line. Okay. <laughs> I'm all right, big writing. <laughs> <laughs> so... Armed with this accumulated evidence for cosmology and symbolism within spinning and weaving, I embarked upon my research inquiry, which was to try and ascertain whether any traces of this symbolic and ritual understanding of the crafts of spinning and weaving that I have just presented could be discovered amongst contemporary practitioners. I was fortunate enough to be able to contact spinners and weavers via two UK guilds, which facilitated access to their thoughts and practices. I won't prevail upon you as to the nitty gritty of the research process. Suffice to say that 24 hours after the online questionnaire had been posted, I already had 47 replies. 
which says quite a lot about Guild members, perhaps. In all, there were 60 respondents. I will try and give you something of a short, balanced overview of the research findings and cherry-pick the more striking features that engaged, emerged from the findings and try to put them in the words of the spinners and weavers themselves. One thing that is important to say is that although most of the respondents were Guild members, there is no sense of uniformity in their responses. Their results were wide-ranging and often contradictory. <coughs> Firstly, their motivation. Two contrasting stimuli that drew them to the crafts of spinning and weaving were working with their hands and an outlet for creativity, the tactile and the creative, or you prefer, hand and head. There was also a very real sense of vocation, comments suggesting a notion of destiny, such as, cannot not weave, weaving chose me, seems to be in my genes, resonated with the fate metaphor, which we have discussed earlier. Respondents were generally aware and informed about the ancestral legacy that lies behind spinning and weaving. One interviewee said that she felt a strong sense of continuation and connection with, the women, with women through the ages who have spun. And for the most part, they felt that they were adding a tradition rather than merely preserving it. The respondents didn't feel that spinning and weaving were fundamentally female pursuits, although the 60 respondents, sorry, the 60 spinners and weavers who replied, only three were men. Indeed, a visit to a craft fair or a trade fair like the knitting and stitching show is likely to reveal a strong gender bias. In many ways, they prove provide a legitimate opportunity for women to bond together, a kind of women's collective. Respondents did not feel connected with the mythology in particular. There were contrasting comments. One respondent um, considers myths old-fashioned and portray the past and therefore not relevant to the present. Conversely, another saw myths as Vit of vital importance to our understanding of the minds and focus of our ancestral paths. Indeed, another, speaking of constantly unravelling weaving as a child in order to conserve wool, actually associated herself with Penelope from Homer's Odyssey. Conspicuous in the data is the sense that routine and practice were specific to each individual and contingent upon practical necessity. There was not a strong sense of ritual practice. They may wish to avoid an interpretation of their crafts as habit, which would suggest perhaps a loss of spontaneity. Whereas the rhythmic aspects of the activity clearly resonated with the respondents, they embraced the transformative potential of rhythm to induce both greater focus and perhaps paradoxically a mesmeric state. Rhythm is part of me, says one interviewee, who speaks of a definite shift whereby the physicality takes her into what Rappaport terms extraordinary time. She goes on to say, it's the rhythm, it's the rhythm. Find it amazing, quickly taking into the moment. Everything fades away. Another remarks, another remarks that rhythm, the rhythms of spinning have a physical effect on her breathing taking her to a quieter place, whereas the physical reaction to the rhythms of weaving provoke counting and chanting, like perhaps the walking songs of the Outer Hebrides. One of the more striking points uncovered by the research was the positive reaction of respondents to the idea of the physicality of weaving and spinning assist in gaining an awareness of one's inner self. The overall sense was that the space is contingent on necessity. The locale of spinning and weaving tends to be every day. It's in my dining room. We live with my loom and wheel, said one practitioner. Contrasting opinions concerning weaving and spinning as magi magical acts were revealed. 
One respondent spoke of spinning and weaving acting as elements of pagan ritual to create objects of charged energy. Conversely, another commented that maybe in the context of the misery of pre-industrial cottage industries, the term magic glow might be inappropriate. One of the interviewees who talked of the magic of plying had been a physics undergraduate, but had only had the physical sense of these counterforces when she started spinning. Some respondents and interviewees spoke uninhibitedly or in the association with weaving and spinning, and specific operations were discussed in these terms. That's where the magic happens. For some, perhaps, the intangibility of the symbolic side of spinning and weaving, the specialness, can be safely articulated in such terms, magic being an idea that many are familiar with from childhood. I think I'm right. One pattern that emerged suggests that questions that are more profound and metaphysical provoke a substantial proportion of strongly antithetical reactions. In many ways, the terminology proved to be a barrier. For some, the term sacred was intrin intrinsically equated with religion. One interview insisted that since she was a committed atheist, her work was special rather than sacred. I tried to avoid terms like spirit, referring to essence instead, but when asked whether handcrafted textiles have a soul, the respondents were, for the most, most part, strongly resistant. It is possible to surmise that not all people engage with such concepts on a daily basis. Some may have a familiarity with them through religion or a more new age dialectic, but many will not have considered them, especially within the context of an artisan craft. So perhaps the fact that 11 respondents were open to the idea that spinning and weaving could, form, could be forms of sacred acts was in itself quite striking. Despite being sceptical to the idea of handcrafted textiles having a soul, they were enthusiastic about the notion of handcrafted textiles containing the history of their making. One respondent felt that when, when you buy a piece of handmade textile, you are buying part of someone's life. Another believed that some, someone, when someone handles a handcrafted article, they receive a gift from the maker even long after they are dead. There was a range of reactions about whether tools held knowledge within them. Many of the respondents' additional comments, such as, would lend my tools but not my special ones, or they can use my spindle but not my wheel, suggest that spinners and weavers surveyed are wary of lending their equipment. Conversely, the positive response to the idea of hand-spun yarn retaining the essence of the fleece suggests that the respondents Yarn and fleece retain essence, but tools do not. However, this notion of tools retaining essence is one I personally experienced when purchasing a second-hand spinning wheel. I was drawn to the action and sound, and the spinner who sold it to me suggested that the wheel had sung to me. They were asked whether spinning and weaving implements hold a sense of the sacred, and the results provoked a mixed response. But interestingly, the positive, the more positive, sorry, but interestingly, more positive than the question as to whether weaving and spinning can be considered sacred activities. The results led to an even split, slightly weighted towards the skeptical, but more than a third were open to the idea of sacred tools, with six respondents strongly relating to the notion. The findings suggest that a significant number of spinners and weavers surveyed felt that they were at the centre of their world when engaged with their practice. The questionnaire does not specify and the answers do not clarify whether this access Monday is a personal or a universal one. Is this centre a threshold to something wider than the individual? One interviewee thinks that it is. She writes in the text box, 
I experience a deep sense of, sense of spirituality in connection with spinning. Moreover, the positive results regarding whether respondents feel at one with their equipment reflects the experiential nature of their opinions. Embracing the idea of embodiment is not particularly easy, so maybe this is the consequence of a phenomenological approach. Sensing being at one with their loom, spindle or spinning wheel, rather than perceiving the notion cognitively. This pattern suggests that where the survey surveyed, weavers and spinners employed a knowledge that is instinctive and comes directly from the activity, then they are open to some kind of operational symbolism. The results of my research, while wide-ranging and notwithstanding an inbuilt resistance in some areas, would indicate that where spinners and weavers amongst those surveyed, there were spinners and weavers amongst those surveyed, who respond to a symbolic, even a spiritual side. Two balances are pivotal. The first is the arc between the pragmatic and the cosmological, the sacred and the ordinary, with its propensity to shift in accordance with the dynamics of the textile project. The notion that Peter Mattieri speaks of with reference to a Maori culture of a relative sacrality is, I think, of value here. Weaving and spinning remains a functional empirical means of cloth production, but have the capacity for some of the surveyed practitioners to be symbolic. The second balance is that between the individual and the cosmological. The results suggest that the intensity and focus of the activities lead inwards towards a personal center. But it is when the sense of centering is regarded as collective, indeed all embracing, that weaving and spinning can start to have the propensity to encompass cosmological aspect. The research data has been worked into a woven textile. Yeah. <laughs> the material manifestation of my reflex research, its parameters having been entirely determined by the data. Reconfigured through 11 different colors of weft, weft yarn, the respondents have been woven across the warp, itself representing the 60 respondents. Rather than display as an Excel spreadsheet, the results are revealed in their entirety in one glance. It is the nature of research analysis to search for patterns. Here the pattern literally materializes during the weaving process, making the metaphor a physical reality. Data is transformed from line to surface in precisely the way that Tim Ingle depicts, that is, as it is progressively converted into a different medium into a format familiar to textile practitioners themselves. If my woven textile contains the narrative the research responses, then perhaps the answer to the research is displayed within the fabric, with darker, more opaque colors generally representing a more solid, skeptical stance, and lighter, more luminous shades depicting a more symbolic position the textile actually articulates the position of the spinners and weavers who undertook my research. The fact that there is a luminous quality in the woven textile is eloquence of the presence of a positive openness towards cosmology and sacred symbolism amongst practitioners asked. Thank you. <laughs>